Welcome to Faith Focals. My name is Faith. Today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite movies, Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. I can't express how much this movie speaks to me as someone who has wanted to be a creative for a while. Uh, for a long time, I have planned to do that as a uh, fiction novelist. These days, I'm trying to find an outlet for that by running a YouTube channel and talking about stories like this one. I don't know why more YouTubers don't talk about Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. It's a, a delightful movie. Mr. Megorium is the elderly uh, owner of the shop, Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. Uh, actually, he's been around for 243 years now. And uh, this is more than any to uh, old toy store. There is a certain magic to it. Uh, what I've heard referred to as a soft magic, the kind where you don't really know what the rules to the magic are, but we are given one rule. You can only see it if you believe in it. That, of course, is very important to the message of the whole movie. Our main character in the movie is the manager, Molly Mahoney. She's 23 years old and still trying to figure out what she's supposed to do with her life a year out of college. I can definitely relate to having a certain reputation for uh, a skill uh, as you're growing up from childhood and then uh, stepping into adulthood and struggling with how do you apply this skill. Hers is uh, piano. She's been trying to write her own concerto for quite a while, but I I guess uh, you don't have to write fiction in order to get writer's block. You remember when I was a little girl and I could play Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto and everyone was talking about my potential? Mm -hmm. Well, I am 23 now and everyone's still talking about my potential. But if you ask me to play the song I know best, I'll still play Rachmaninoff's second. May I suggest you stun the world with Molly Mahoney's first? I want to but I am stuck. Come with me. Mr. Megorium presents Mahoney with this uh, block of wood, which he calls the Congreve Cube, and she is understandably bewildered. He tends to have that effect on people. He is uh, bewildering, has his own sense of logic with its own childish uh, kind of uh, angle on it. Uh, very unique for someone who's 243 years old. So he explains the cube to her. Unlikely adventures require unlikely tools. Are we going on an adventure? Oh, my dear, we're already on one. All I will say is this. With faith, love, this block, and a counting mutant, you may find yourself somewhere you've never imagined. Mr. Megorium has already told Mahoney about his intention to hire an accountant. Uh, and despite having successfully run the store for over 200 years, uh, he still is a bit fuzzy on the subject of accounting. He figures the word accountant must be a blend between the word counting and the word mutant. And so uh, this is where the uh, concept of the counting mutant comes from. The accountant does eventually arrive at the store uh, as human as you would expect and as starched as you would expect in person, if not just in suit. Definitely very rigid. Um, when Mahoney tries to crack a joke, uh, he doesn't uh, smile or laugh. Uh, she feels the need to explain it to him and he says, I know. So Mr. Megorium gives him a quick interview, decides he's the right man for the job, even though Mahoney disagrees. This accountant certainly does not seem to embody the lively spirit of the store. The accountant has a name, Henry Weston, but we'll call him Mutant from now on because that's what everyone else in the store calls him, except for uh, one significant character. Mr. Megorium shows Mutant around the store, and uh, they eventually get to the pile of documents that Mr. Megorium has been saving but not organizing. And Mutant asks him what is so important about getting these documents organized just now. I'm leaving the store. The world. Do you see these shoes? I found these in a tiny little shop in Tuscany and fell in love with them so entirely I bought enough to last my whole life. <laughs> these are my last pair. It would be easy to read some grown-up concepts into the idea that Mr. Megorium is leaving the world because he's down to his uh, last pair of fine Italian shoes. 
Uh, I think the movie expects us to be a little bit more mature than that and to take everything at the level of a child. We're not uh, expected to read any motive into why Mr. Megorium uh, feels it is his time to depart. We're just to recognize that at 243 years old, he has had enough life experience to recognize his time to depart uh, well in advance of when it's going to arrive. He gives this announcement to the mutant at uh, what I believe is the key event. Uh, so we've had our inciting incident, which is when he tells Mahoney that uh, he's planning to hire an accountant. But this key event tells us why he's hiring the accountant, and it brings everything into sharp focus for us. Mr. Megorium is, to be brutally plain, dying. He's trying to figure out how much the store is worth for the sake of whomever is going to receive it after his departure. So the mutant gets uh, hard at work. The work is hard because uh, there's hundreds of years of documents to sort through, some of which are beyond belief. According to your employment records, you've had several fictional characters on the books. Like whom? The king of planet Yahweh. Oh, he's not fictional. Sir, there are people down- He's not really the king, and the planet Yahweh doesn't exist, but he's not fictional. Well, that's the thing. If there's no planet- Mr. Weston, yes, you can't blame people for having aspirations. I'll have something more to say about this clip in a bit. Mutant is trying to enlist Mahoney's help to understand what in the world is going on with this toy store and its crazy proprietor. Hello, please. Give me one second, please. Mahoney, wait. I just need a simple explanation. Sure. It's a magical toy store. There's no such thing as a magical toy store. Of course there is. When you say magical, do you mean special? No, I mean magical. Unique? Magical. How about really, really cool? What's behind me, all right, is a toy store. It is a big one, it is a weird one, but it is just a toy store. I knew it as soon as I saw that suit. Knew what? You're a just guy. What's a just guy? A guy just like you. Same hair, same suit. Same shoes, walks around. No matter what, he thinks, oh, it's just a store. This is just a bench. It's just a tree. It's just what it is, nothing more. Right. But, but this is just a store. I'm sure to you, it is. And so although the movie doesn't uh, make this obvious, we watch Mahoney write the mutant off as just a just guy. In the next scene, we see her riding the bus back home from work, and she catches a glimpse of this ad that asks, do you have a sparkle? And we can see her insecurity here. And we know where that insecurity comes from. It comes from this idea that she's stuck. And I think there's a reason these two scenes are back to back. Uh, she has written off the just guy as just a just guy, uh, and yet she has also written herself off too. Otherwise, she would not be insecure about her inability to come up with uh, her concerto. She has this pattern of dealing with individuals, including herself, and is unconsciously guilty of the uh, same issues that she sees in the mutant. There's another character we get introduced to early in the movie. Eric Applebaum is a nine-year-old with big ears, a wonderful hat collection, and a future in engineering. He's pretty grown up for his age, but that comes with the side effect of having trouble making friends his age. Uh, all of the adults in his life would really love to see him make some friends. They keep encouraging him to make friends, uh, but he feels lost as to how to go about that. He feels much more at ease playing solitaire than playing with the other kids. And they feel much more at ease playing amongst themselves than playing with the weird kid. It's not my fault people don't like me. People love you once they get the chance to know you. No, they don't. They think I'm weird. Because you build sculptures by yourself. Because nobody wants to play with me. Have you asked anyone to play with you? Not really. <laughs> well, Eric, you have to give people a chance. I know it'll happen. You don't, sweetheart. Trust me, people are always full of surprises. Just, just pick someone, anyone. Pick someone you don't know and try to make friends with them. See what happens. I don't even know how to start. Easy, start by saying hi. 
So again, we find ourselves introduced to a character who has written himself off, assuming that the other kids are going to uh, write him off as well. It's to his credit that the person that he chooses to approach when he takes his mother's advice the next day is someone who also is prone to getting written off. There's a cute scene of of him and the mutant having a conversation in writing. Uh, The mutant is in uh, Mr. Megorium's office working. There's a glass window And they uh, write on uh, pieces of paper or notepads uh, to have this uh, kind of introduction. Unfortunately, by this point of the movie, uh, we're aware as an audience of a storm brewing in the store. Uh, There's one corner that has been turning gray ever since Mr. Megorium uh, spoke out loud that he was going to be leaving. He identifies this as the storm sulking about his departure. He has tried to speak to the store and get it to shape up. Uh, But today is when this sulking uh, coalesces into a full-fledged temper tantrum. This tantrum comes as he is forced to reveal to Molly Mahoney that he was intending to leave the store to her. She is very upset because she doesn't know how to run the store. She's been managing it, but Mr. Megorium has all the magic. And apparently the store is very upset too. Once they get everything calmed down, all of the guests uh, evacuated, uh, they convene for a meeting And Mr. Megorium explains fully to Mahoney that he is passing away. Uh, Naturally, she is even more upset. She does the only thing she can think to do and has him committed to the hospital. Surely if anyone can keep Mr. Megorium alive, it's going to be the doctors, right? The doctors can't find anything wrong with you. Of course not. I'm perfectly healthy. Then why are you leaving? It's my time to go. That's it? What else could there be? What are we going to do without you? Run the store. Sir, I don't know how. That's why I gave you the concrete cube. But it just sits there. What have you done with it? I don't know what to do with it. It's, it's a block of wood. Can you think of nothing? Well, I'm sure I could think of a million things to do with it. There are a million things one might do with a block of wood. But Mahoney, what do you think might happen if someone just once believed in it? Sir, I don't understand. Mahoney is able to get Mr. Megorium to promise that he'll stick around for one more day. She pleads with the doctors to keep him in the hospital, but they're not able to do that since he's perfectly healthy. They can't keep him against his will. She explains to him that he says that he's ready to go, uh, and the doctor advises her to try to give him as much as possible to live for. So she goes home, and... She does try to put uh, Mr. Megorium's advice into action. She's pleading with this cube to do something, to impart some wisdom to her, to uh, help her uh, to sort all this out. And I suspect it's intentional. Someone pointed out to me that a lot of the people involved in this uh, movie do have uh, potentially religious backgrounds. Her act of pleading with this cube resonates to me with the experience of praying to a uh, being that admittedly uh, cannot be seen and does not speak back. My heart goes out to her as uh, we watch her uh, pause and wait for some sort of ray of wisdom to give her the answers. And then finally she says, All right, I'll do it myself. The next day, she goes to the store to pick up a few things in preparation for her master plan to show Mr. Megorium how much there is to live for, and she finds the mutant sitting there on a bench outside the store. Uh, So she explains to him she's not here to work, she's just going in and coming out, and he offers to run the store for her. Now, this is out of character for him. Usually, he's tied down to his numbers. He told Eric that he is always working. He doesn't see anything special or magical about the store, so it's not like he has any heart for the store, Uh, but he does have a heart for the people in the store, and he recognizes that his way of showing that he cares can sometimes come across wrong. I just, I felt awful because I didn't want you to think that I didn't care, and and I, I do care. It's just... Some people bring flowers or send a card or hug people. You know, I make sure that people's paperwork is all filled out properly. And so today I thought I'd try something different. This decision to help run the store uh, later gives Mutant a chance to bond with Eric and they become uh, friends with one another. So that's a huge victory for Eric. Meanwhile, Uh, Mahoney takes Mr. Megorium through the town to several locations. They do several uh, eccentric things. 
But she's still disappointed when he says that this has been a wonderful last day. Uh, she intended to show him all there is to live for, but he is uh, still gently uh, insistent that there is no changing his decision to leave today. Mahoney gets a chance to say goodbye to him. Uh, this is the third plot point. Uh, so this is his last chance to give her something that will help her to uh, survive this trial and to emerge the hero by the end of the movie. When King Lear dies in Act 5, do you know what Shakespeare has written? He's written, he dies. That's all, nothing more. No fanfare, no metaphor, no brilliant final words. The culmination of the most influential work of dramatic literature is, he dies. It takes Shakespeare a genius to come up with, he dies. And yet every time I read those two words, I find myself overwhelmed with dysphoria. And I know it's only natural to be sad, but not because of the words he dies, but because of the life we saw prior to the words. I've lived all five of my ex Mahoney, and I am not asking you to be happy that I must go. I'm only asking that you turn the page Continue reading and let the next story begin. And if anyone ever asks what became of me, you relate my life in all its wonder and end it with a simple and modest, he died. I love you. I love you too. Your life is an occasion. Rise to it. I'll go ahead and skip past a lot of the climax. I will confirm that Mr. Magoriam uh, does pass away. We don't see it on screen, but we do uh, see his funeral. The tension of the climax is whether Mahoney in her grief is going to make a decision that she's going to regret. Both Eric and the mutant uh, do their part to uh, help her through it. And uh, she finally figures out how to believe in the Congreve cube. And we get to see uh, what happens when you believe in a Congreve cube. And without breaking the fourth wall, the mutant tells Mahoney uh, his assessment on what the meaning of the movie is. It's you. You are a block of wood. I'm a block of wood? <laughs> yeah, Mahoney, it's you. What you need to believe in is not the cube, and it's not the store, it's not me. What you need to believe in is you. Holy cow. What is it? A sparkle. <laughs> so on the surface, this movie seems to have uh, the message that I've often said is uh, overused. The message to uh, believe in yourself. Everything else will come together if you just believe in yourself. I do think there is something a little bit more to this movie, though. In our cast of uh, four major characters, especially the three who don't pass away at some point in the movie, there is a lot of uh, interchangeability. We uh, first meet Mahoney and we see she's uh, oppressed with this self-doubt. Uh, and you know who else is oppressed with self-doubt is Eric. Uh, he doesn't think he can uh, make any friends. That's preventing him from moving forward. So we meet them pretty early and then the mutant comes on the scene and uh, Mahoney doesn't warm to him. He's not a warm kind of guy. Mahoney just writes him off as a just guy. And I think it's a shame that the mutant doesn't get enough credit uh, during the story, I think. Even Mr. Magorium frowns at him at one point for doing his job, the thing that Mr. Magorium hired him for. Uh, but it's, it's played off comically. 
But it seems like people around the mutant don't quite understand him. There's, and we can tell he, this, he's socially awkward. When he first meets Mahoney, he says hello to her several times because clearly he's uh, nervous about interacting with uh, one of the staff at the store in the upcoming interview. He plays it cool, uh, but we can tell he uh, struggles with people. And you know who else struggles with people is Eric. So it makes a lot of sense that Eric and the mutant would eventually bond and become friends because they both share one thing in common and it's that other people uh, don't tend to believe in them. And it's interesting that the man that Mahoney uh, sees as about as lifeless as a block of wood happens to tell Mahoney that she's the one who's the block of wood in a good way. Just as it takes the mutant stepping up and offering to help out at the store because he wants to try something different because he cares, Eric needs to step up and offer someone a hello because he thinks that he is worth having a friend, and Mahoney needs to step up and believe in herself because there's a life ahead of her and she has aspirations. But I think it's telling at the third plot point, Mr. Magorium doesn't give Mahoney the advice to believe in herself another time. She already has that advice. The advice she needs to hear at the very end, just as he's about to die, is his philosophy on death. And he admits death is tragic. Even he gets filled with dysphoria over the passing of King Lear. And what makes death tragic is not death itself. It's what death is taking away. We watch Mr. Magorium and we see a man who is generous and playful There's so many good qualities about him, and he's had 243 years of putting these good qualities into the world. The world can't be anything except better for his having been there. And now he's going to leave, and there is no Mr. Magorium left to replace him. And so, yeah, that is what makes death tragic. It's the loss of something incredibly valuable. And as he's acknowledging this, it sounds to me like Mr. Magorium's message to Mahoney is, as sad as it is, don't stay stuck. Instead, live a life such that people will mourn you at the time of your passing. I always go back to the Bible at the end of these videos because uh, I think a good story uh, teaches us a truth, and the Bible is the only reliable book of uh, truth that I know of. Now, the Bible teaches us that death started at an event called the fall. And if we're going to follow Mr. Magorium's example, we don't want to look just at the fall where death began. We want to look before the fall to see what was lost ahead of that time. And we can find the answer to that question in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1 here, uh, we see the account of God creating the first man. We're told, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So the Bible is definitely very emphatic about the uh, the reality that every human being bears the image of God. And that's very significant. It gives us value as human beings. Uh, What happens to us happens to the image of God. How we treat one another is an expression of our worship to God. Whether we are kind to our fellow human beings because we desire to be kind to God and to express our uh, worship of him that way, or whether we are cruel to human beings, which shows that we have no care for the image of God or the creator behind that image. And just like Mahoney, the mutant, and Eric in Mr. Magorium's Wonder Emporium, No one should write anyone off just based on surface impression. There's something deeper within that image of God that gives each of us great value. It's worth a second look. And the Bible tells us that in the beginning, the intention was that every man and woman uh, would live continually. However, God also did plant in the Garden of Eden, where the first man and the first woman lived, a tree known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 2, God is instructing Adam, the first man, regarding this tree, and he tells Adam, uh, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Unfortunately, we don't know what would have happened if Adam had chosen not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just as God has in- had instructed him. 
Perhaps God would have arranged for us to have the blessing of that tree also had our uh, first parents uh, obeyed him. But the Bible tells us that the woman, Eve, uh, did choose to eat from the tree. She was uh, convinced to uh, by a serpent who turns out to be uh, God's enemy. And her husband followed her example. So in Genesis chapter 3, God tells the man and the woman uh, what the consequences are for uh, this disobedience. And he reiterates in uh, different words what he told Adam the first time. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And this is not a comment about Adam's value. Adam carries the image of God, so this is not that. It's a callback to when God created Adam uh, earlier in Genesis 2. We're told, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So God breathed life into the dust of the ground to make the first man. And unfortunately, Adam, knowing the consequences for disobedience to God, uh, did choose to disobey God. And that brought death into the world. And not just his death. Genesis chapter 5 gives us the genealogy of Adam's descendants. And there's a lot of information to be found from seeing the names as they came down through time. But through this genealogy, there is also a solemn drumbeat, like a funeral march. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Thus, all the days of Mahalel were 895 years, and he died. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Now this one's an interesting uh, exception. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. One of maybe only two people I can think of in the Bible who uh, were not told that they died. However, thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. The next chapter in Genesis tells us about how the wickedness of man increased to the point where God decided to judge the entire world through a flood. And in the lead up to that uh, account of the flood in Genesis 7, uh, we're told everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark. God had given instruction to Noah uh, how to save himself and his family. Noah did obey God, and so he and uh, his family and those animals that he brought on the ark uh, were saved from uh, this death, from the flood. But the sin of man brought death, not just to man's descendants, who the Bible says each of us sin. So we're not dying for the sin of Adam. We're dying each for our own sins against God. Uh, But Adam's sin did not only bring death to each of his descendants, it also brought death to uh, every living thing in creation. Romans chapter 8 tells us, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, that would be Adam, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And that's because even from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned and God enforced the uh, curse of death on the human race, God did promise that there would be a deliverer who would rescue humanity from the curse. However, although Noah did rescue humanity and the animals with him on the ark from the flood, uh, he was not that deliverer. We're told in Genesis chapter 9, all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. And we all know that this uh, procession of death has continued down through history almost without fail. Again, I can think of two exceptions, uh, Enoch and Elijah, who uh, who were taken by God rather than uh, being made to die. However, we do have a promise from God that that's going to change. In Isaiah 65, 17, we're told, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. 
but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So what we're seeing here is there's going to be a change in the order of things when this new heaven and new earth are instituted. And it's going to be such a change that if someone dies at a hundred years old, which we consider old age today, they will be considered then as only a child or maybe cursed because of some rebellion against God. Ezekiel speaking the words of God says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed, and keeps all my statutes, and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him, for the righteousness that he has done he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness, and does injustice, and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered. For the treachery of which he is guilty, and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. So we're seeing a couple principles regarding death here. If a wicked person repents and turns away from his sin, then he is promised life. However, if a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and commits sin, then he will die. Unfortunately, the truth is, as we see in Romans 3, uh, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And in fact, a lot of the time when we try to do good, it's because we're being self-serving. We want to be seen as good. There's something in it for ourselves. Or we often try to approach God as if he were made in our image rather than us in his image. And so it's impossible as a human being with a sinful nature to perfectly turn away from our wickedness and hold on to righteousness. And that's a great tragedy because billions and billions of images of God, all of these lives of great value, are continually being lost to eternity over the course of human history. Fortunately, as Ezekiel says, God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, so he made a plan to fix that. In John 11, we see Jesus, God the Son, while he was on earth, he's speaking to some uh, friends of his, sisters of a man named Lazarus, who passed away due to illness. In this example, he's speaking to the sister Martha, and Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So she responds to him, saying, Yes, she does believe, and it's because of his credentials. He is the Son of God which is the same in this case as saying he is God the Son. He is the Christ, which is the Greek form of the word Messiah, which means the anointed one, one chosen for a specific task. In this case, he's the chosen deliverer, which she means when she says who is coming into the world. She's implying that he is coming from outside of the world to perform this task. But the main point here is that he's promised that everyone who believes in him will never die. Everyone who puts their faith in Jesus is doing the same as turning away from their wickedness and holding on to righteousness. We're not able to hold on to our own righteousness, that's beyond us, but he offers us his righteousness, that's what we can hold on to, and therefore receive this promise of eternal life. And Paul explains this for us in the book of Romans chapter 5. He says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sitting was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in short, what he's saying here is that just as the cycle of sin and death started because of one man, Adam, All it takes is one man, Jesus Christ, to put an end to it and to give us justification with God. Now, it takes one special man. Not just any man can be the substitute for all the sinners in the world. It takes someone who never sinned. Jesus is the only human being who's never sinned. It takes God the Son. Jesus is the only human being who is God the Son. But because Jesus did die and then he rose again, death has lost its tragedy. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, referring to those of us who once we pass away, then go on to live eternally in heaven, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's important to address that this victory comes to those of us who believe in Jesus as the Son of God who died and rose again to pay for our sins. Those of us who have accepted him to be our Savior. And if that sounds appealing to you, if you're wondering if that is something that's possible for you to do also, it very much is. I would encourage you to get a Bible or find someone who knows the Bible well. If you need a free Bible, you can go to blb.org. That's my favorite site. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I just love that tool. I would recommend you start at one of the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And uh, if you're of an analytical uh, frame of mind after that, you might check out the Book of Romans, which goes to explain uh, a lot of the uh, details there. What's key is that you believe what the Bible says about Jesus and that you recognize that his death was to pay for your sins, that you accept that death and receive it for yourself. Now, I promised I would say something about uh, one of the clips from earlier. It's the one where Mr. Megorium uh, is referring to the king of planet Yahweh as uh, his employee. Yahweh is a reference to the name of God as given in the Bible. And in fact, I think there are many people of uh, Jewish background who would uh, consider the use of that name specifically uh, to be pushing it, to be uh, disrespecting God. My understanding is that is the name that God gave Moses. Uh, Moses asked God what name he should give to the Israelite people to distinguish the one true God from the false gods of Egypt where they were living as slaves at the time. But given that I've heard that the director of the movie and a couple of the actors are uh, Jewish, then I uh, wonder if they were intentionally pushing the envelope there. Certainly, there is some pushing the envelope to suggest that the king of planet Yahweh, one, is dealing in falsehood. Not a king, no planet Yahweh. Two, is an employee of Mr. Megorium, which would put him under Mr. Megorium. And three, has aspirations. Uh, The one true God is above everything. There is nothing higher for God to aspire to. 
Now, maybe I might be tempted to uh, overlook uh, this uh, irreverence for the sake of the story, which encourages us not to overthink things. However, there is a scene later, the meeting where Mr. Megorium is explaining his upcoming departure. And out of all the grown-ups in the room, it's uh, little Eric who figures out what it is that Mr. Megorium means. Mahoney? I think he means he's going to heaven. Right? Heaven, Elysium, Shangri-La. <laughs> I may return as a bumblebee. I think the word I need to express my emotions at this scene is the word dysphoria. That sounds like a great word for uh, what I feel here. Because the fact that Mr. Megorium is uncertain about the uh, reality ahead of him uh, reveals to me that if he does have uh, the king of planet Yahweh who is not a king and who doesn't rule over the planet Yahweh on the books, then he can't possibly know the God who uh, named himself Yahweh in the Bible, because that God has described only two realities uh, for us human beings who pass away. In the book of Matthew, when Jesus was preaching his Sermon on the Mount, he said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. These are the only two realities that the God of the Bible gives for those who pass away. Either they have uh, gone through the narrow gate and uh, find life, meaning eternal life as a result of accepting uh, Christ's death and resurrection uh, for their salvation, uh, or they have gone through the wide gate, uh, which we're told leads to destruction. There's a similar passage in Luke, Luke chapter 13, where Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you wickers of an evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And the point in this second passage is there are people like Mr. Megorium, who claims to have a relationship with the king of planet Yahweh, uh, who may profess to know God and may expect to enter uh, God's kingdom, but only on the basis of their good deeds alone. But as I showed from Romans, there is no one righteous. And so we need that personal relationship with Jesus in order to be qualified to enter heaven for eternity. So as much as I love this movie, the only comfort that I can take from it regarding Mr. Megorium's passing is one, the quality of the life we're told that he had such that e even us audience members who've been with him only a few minutes mourn his passing. And two, the fact that he's fictional. This means that he doesn't run the risk of the destruction uh, that we're told is a reality according to the Bible. A place that the Bible calls the lake of fire, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth for eternity. I don't like to linger on the subject because I think if we're coming to Jesus for salvation, uh, I would rather see people coming to him because they recognize how glorious he is and how glorious God is. Uh, but it's a reality that needs to be addressed. And it's a reality that does get raised by Mr. Megorium's evasion of it. And so it's something I can't shy away from here. Overall, I see this movie as one with a message uh, to give your fellow human being a second look, to look for the image of God that is inside each and every one of us, and not just to write people off because they strike you as odd on first impression. And if for some reason you struggle with issues regarding your self-value, I hope that this video is an encouragement to you to uh, share with you that you do have uh, probably the greatest value any human being ever can have, the, the bearing of that image of God within you. That is a marvelous gift that he has uh, granted us human beings, uh, even though we certainly are not worthy of it. I think that's a sign that he loves you. I think the message of the Bible is that he cares for you and wants the best for you. So God bless you.